right, so tonight's session is our last session of AO North America Link Volume 1. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about an interesting topic tonight called complications. As we know, we uh, have been through this before many times, but AO and A Link is about listening, integrating, networking, and knowledge. So we're going to provide you with some of that tonight. As always, thanks to Dr. Rout and Dr. Aker for their support along the way. Bill's on the keys, answering questions, keep them coming. We're really excited about our guest faculty this evening, Dr. Joe Patterson. Joe, can you tell us where you're coming from, where you've been, and then maybe give the students who just matched any piece of advice for how to use their time before they our residents. Sure, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I, I did my residency in San Francisco and my fellowship at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Uh, that time after things wind down at the end of medical school, some of the best time of your life before work really gets serious, but also really interesting and fun. Yeah, some people travel, some people explore other things in life for a minute before they lock into an orthopedic career. But if you're a huge nerd like me, I sat at a computer and I learned Stata, uh, or a statistical programming language. And it probably changed my life in terms of increasing my interest in research and my skill set and ability to do it. Uh, and I don't regret that at all. So those are my two cents, but not everyone chooses that path. What, what did you do, Phil? I went to Thailand for three weeks, so it was two, awesome. Two, two sides of the coin, both beneficial yep. for sure. Wouldn't have changed a thing uh, either, so. There we go. So enjoy your time. Tonight we're talking about complications. You can see where we've been. We've covered a whole lot, so thanks for sticking with us. Taylor, this just might be a good time on that last slide to just plug. Yeah. You know, we, have, we have been re-upped for next year and potentially many years to come. So congratulations to all the fourth years that matched, but keep in mind, you're welcome to join us as interns next year. And for all the MS twos, threes and beyond, <clears throat> we will have an updated curriculum being published probably within the next several weeks here. It's not just gonna be a revamp of this past year. We're gonna have topics also of interest to folks who will get going into orthopedics, but. Uh, a big, a wider variety of subspecialties, for example, hip replacement, knee arthroplasty. Uh, what about upper extremity, rotator cuff, ACL, sports medicine? So our goal is not just to be so trauma centric. We really want to get you prepared for life as a resident, uh, be it in orthopedic residency and beyond. Um, so stay tuned for an updated curriculum for next year. That's it. Definitely, definitely a great plug. Also, another quick plug, AO Milestones. All right, don't forget to ask questions. You guys know the drill by now. Quick recap of last month, we talked about polytrauma. And so polytrauma is really focused on dealing with complex injuries like the one we talked about shown here while balancing a critically ill patient who you're dealing with things like acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia because their lives are at stake in that setting. The trauma itself is an inflammatory process, but then surgery is also. And so we talk about how that inflammatory process can induce a second hit. Really one of the key things we talked about was sequencing and how we tackle these complex problems. They're really like a puzzle. And one of the important parts of that is ongoing assessment throughout your time in the operating room. And ultimately it's a systematic approach and your institution may have varying protocols, so you have to know them, but at the heart of it all is multidisciplinary communication and collaboration. And we also hit on a couple of these learning points listed here. Things like long bone limits, prioritizing open fractures, like we said before, reassessing and monitoring physiology with your anesthesia colleagues. And you can always temporize things. You can put on an axis, you can put things in traction, you can splint things, don't forget that. And then you want to really re recognize those things that we consider orthopedic emergencies. 
So all through all 10 sessions, we've been leaning on these AO principles. I guess this is the 10th session. So in the past nine we had. Tonight, we're going to cover a few things. And the first thing we want to, uh, I guess, convey is that we all have to be realistic that complications occur. Any, what, what's the only way to not get a complication? That's what we always say. Don't Probably to do, don't, yeah, don't operate, right? And so complications occur and they're a reality. And so when we encounter them, we just want to be realistic. We want to think about why they happened. We want to reflect and then we want to act and formulate a plan. We also want to get a little objective for you and give you some pearls related to things like non-union and fracture related infection, which are some of the common complications we may encounter. So let's get a little philosophical for a minute. What is a complication? So here's one definition that I found, uh, and it's a medical problem that occurs during a disease or after a procedure or treatment, and the complication itself may be caused by the disease, the procedure, or the treatment, but may be unrelated to them as well. And so one of the distinctions that I think is important to make that an error could be defined as a complication, but a complication is not always an error. Sometimes we go into a surgery realizing the risk of a complication is very high. And so the key is being realistic about that with the patient. I don't know, would you guys agree with that? Do you have any interesting philosophical thoughts on that distinction, that line? What, what do you think about complications in general? I think that's a great way to delineate the two, Taylor. And, you know, not every error results in a complication, although some can. Perfect. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the strategies that you might find useful in your practice when you see complications. Some of the things that uh, came to my mind, at least, were prior to any surgery, being really realistic in that discussion you have with your patient about preoperative counseling, a shared decision-making process that leads to a, a thorough informed consent. And then when you encounter a complication, you're not burying your head in the sand, you're acknowledging it, you're recognizing it as early as possible, and you're doing something about it. Any different thoughts? I think a tendency often uh, with complications is to kind of shy away uh, from it. And uh, you really have to fight some of those uh, internal feelings uh, or uh, hesitations and run uh, really headlong into these situations. And so these are the patients you spend the most time with, whether it's an infection or a, a, a bad outcome, uh, you you run headlong into it. I'm, I'm really interested in what uh, Aker uh, would say about this as well, because uh, he's got a, a, a lot of experience, you know, with a lot of complicated patients, high risk patients. Um, so. I thought you were going to say I have a lot of complications, so I've learned how to deal with them. I almost did that, yeah, but a, I didn't. I saw that coming. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, I would say that uh, once uh, the medical students get into residency, they're not only going to be faced with problem patients and complications, but also they may be patients transferred in with infections from outside hospitals and other surgeons that didn't go so well, and they end up managing others' complications. <clears throat> and a, a real good bit of advice is to always take the high road. You know, like sometimes the complication has nothing to do with you. You might be the second opinion and the patients will be inquisitive. You know, what, what happened? Did, did the other doctor do something wrong? I just think it's, it's uh, kind of the karma police, you know, like, because I know that my patients sometimes end up in other people's offices as well. So I think it's a very chivalrous attitude to just take the high road. And when a patient is asking about, you know, what, what happened here? It's nice to say, well, you know, I, I wasn't there. I'm sure like nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to do a bad job today. Everybody has made that's made it this far gets up and works as hard as they possibly can for the patients to do the best they can. So although sometimes other physicians are having undesirable outcomes, it's nice to take the high road 
uh, and try not to implicate others in the problem. Some of that stuff will work. It's it'll work itself out. It's not really your job or our job to place blame on anyone when you're seeing and evaluating patients that may have had something happen elsewhere. That's my two cents. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, that all those perspectives are super valuable. To be a little bit more objective, you know, some of the common things we're talking about when we have complications in the orthopedics realm are things like DVTs, pulmonary embolism. We can encounter compartment syndromes like we talked about before, and that can be pre or post surgery some of the time. You can have injury to nerves, vessels, tendons, other important structures. Uh, patients can have residual pain and stiffness and other functional issues. They can also have deformities, things like malunions or bone healing in an inappropriate position that can result in leg length discrepancies or in pediatric patients, growth disturbances. Uh, and then probably most commonly things like infection and wound issues, uh, but also things like delayed union and non-union. And tonight we're going to try to focus on those last two a little bit so we can give you some important knowledge points related to those issues. So let's dive into our first case. This is a 50-year-old patient who had an injury skydiving, is now seven months out, and they're still having some pain, and their x-ray looks like this. Joe, when you encounter a patient like this in your clinic, what's sort of your, your thought process as you're seeing an x-ray uh, and you have the clinical presentation of continued pain? You know, understanding the patient and the mechanism is really important. You're thinking about why something's not healing the way you expect to, and then understanding how the treatment was done. So skydiving sounds like a high energy problem. That's a lot of trauma to the tissue. You may have a biological problem that's contributing to the delayed healing that you're seeing here, a lack of complete healing. Now, what I mean by that is this AP interlateral, the distal femur, I don't see bone bridging across completely on any cortice. So I'm seeing what looks like a non-union contributing to this thigh pain. In what do you, opinion, well, go ahead. What do you, what do, you do to, to make sure that, that there is no bridging callus? Do you get more imaging in your practice usually? When someone comes in like this with pain and at the site of the fracture, and it's been an amount of time where they probably should have healed seven months is longer than I'd expect. The CT scan would be helpful uh, to see if there is healing. If there's partial bridging, you, over time that may progress. But what I'm seeing here is not just that. It looks like there's a little extra lucency around the nail, meaning that the space within the bone is larger than the nail in the distal femur. So it kind of looks like that nail is moving around, maybe side to side. The screws haven't bent or broken, so the fixation's holding on the way it's supposed to, and it looks like it was done technically appropriately, but the fracture itself is not, not healing, and we see that. I don't know if the CT is going to add much with the clinical information. You have it on the right, and it shows that there's no connection to the bone above and below that fracture. And so when, you, when you're seeing this patient uh, and you start to think about causes, uh, what's uh, your first sort of step in that process? Well, anytime we make a cut on somebody, there's a risk of an infection. I think it's the first thing I say when I talk about the risks and benefits of surgery. And while it's quite rare with, you know, nailing up a femur fracture in a closed manner, it can happen. And so that's one of the things I like to put on the top of my differential and then think about some other things about fracture biology and how that interacts with the interventions we do and the physics of the interventions we do. Think about what's the mechanical environment for that fracture and why is it not healing the way it's supposed to? Yeah, those are excellent points. And so, yeah, I mean, I think in general, we would say the first step is to make sure it's not an infected non-union um, or is it a septic non-union in other words, or is it aseptic meaning not infected? And some of the ways we can know that are fairly obvious things things like fevers, chills, and then redness or wound drainage or even pus. Most are not as obvious as the photo shown here, uh, but you often get labs, things like a white blood cell count and then inflammatory markers that suggest inflammation in the body uh, that we use to suggest infection are things like a C-reactive protein and an erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And then like we said, we wanna make sure we get good x-rays 
And sometimes you can see findings of infection on the x-ray. Like Joe said, the, the, the nail was maybe moving. Sometimes you can see lucencies around screws. Uh, you can see fluid collections, things like that on CT scans. And so what is a non-union? Well, a non-union is defined as a fracture that has failed to heal within the expected time frame and probably isn't going to heal unless you do something about it. Whereas a delayed union is a fracture that's just sort of healing slowly and may heal without you having to do anything. Just a couple of distinctions to make there. There are a few types of non-union that we think about. And so the first is a hypertrophic non-union, meaning there's active biology and robust callus formation, but the bone's not united for some reason. And the callus forms because there's a lack of stability and there's a lot of motion. And so the bone responds by trying to get motion and, and form new bone, or excuse me, get stability and form new bone. On the other hand, an atrophic union is a problem lacking biology. Sometimes the vascular supply can be disrupted. It may be caused by too much dissection during surgery or other causes as well. And often the stability is typically sufficient, but not always. Uh, but those are sort of some general ideas about those two. Whereas an oligotrophic nonunion probably falls somewhere in between those two. The other important part of the workup is a thorough history. So we have to go back to sort of our medicine days and put on our medicine hats and start asking a lot of questions about a thorough patient history because there are a lot of host factors that contribute to non-union. A bunch of the things are listed here, but are there things you're doing in clinic to work these up, Joe? Yeah, and it depends on you know my level of suspicion for infection. The, the CRP, the ESR, there's some talk about whether procalcitonin may or may not have a role for thinking about infection. Uh, and then understanding, uh, Dr. Brinker described a set of tests for working up a non-union. It's exhaustive and somewhat expensive, but it covers the things you talked about. Is there underlying metabolic disturbances that could contribute to the non-union, like a thyroid problem or a kidney problem? Uh, is there something treatable you can do to help the fracture heal? Smoking cessation is a huge part of it, too, if the patient is smoking. And then I see a lot of patients with diabetes in my population. So, you know, I refer a lot of folks to uh, registered dietitians to help with guidance about their diet and get their diabetes under better control. What do you guys tell patients who are actively smoking? Will you, will you still do a non-union surgery in a patient who's actively smoking? With, within our group, there's a lot of variability, I would say. We have one side who will not operate on a smoker, even with a kind of debilitating non-union. And then on the other side, we have a partner who will operate on, uh, if you smoke in three packs a day, you know, because he has some uh, some feels, you know, for a patient with a, a bad non-union. So I fall somewhere in the middle. I, it's certainly really important. Uh, a critical part. And if you're going to do a high risk operation, it's like um, if they're, if smoking is a component of them not healing and they don't stop, then you're not doing them any favors at all. So they've got to buy in. They've got to at least cut back in a very meaningful way. Um, so that that's my uh, approach. It's not super dogmatic, but um, these, these are patients that are often debilitated. Uh, so uh, Tim, what do y'all do? I think I'm kind of more like you. I mean, here I am working real hard to do everything I can to try to get your bone to heal. The least you can do is try to help yourself as well, you know, and to me, that doesn't necessarily mean stopping, but cutting back to three cigarettes per day, you know, fig figuring out some sort of meat in the middle if they're unwilling to complete completely quit cold turkey. Um, I agree that less is more. I mean, I, I, I also probably wouldn't have a practice if I would, didn't operate on patients that I thought were less than ideal candidates. So sometimes that's just the reality of the world we live in. You know, not every patient is an ideal host, but you counsel them, you beg them to slow down or stop. And it is what it is. So this patient wasn't a smoker, but uh, what's your plan for this case, Joe? How would you 
think about tackling this case? You know, I want to start off with some blood work. You've already given me all the imaging I think I need, assuming there's x-rays above and everything's fine up top and there's no screws broken up top. So I want to know yeah. CBC with diff, ESR, CRP. Yeah, so they none of the labs were suspicious for infection. Excellent. So this sounds like surprise positive non-uni cases. So if we go in and do a non-uni repair once in a while and we take cultures, the cultures can come back positive even when the markers are negative or totally normal. That's something to always keep in the back of your mind. Um, that said, it makes me more comfortable going forward with the repair. And you can break that into whether you do that in stages. If you're concerned about an infection, you might take out what's in there now temporarily stabilize it one way or another and place something within the bone or around the bone that delivers antibiotics to the area if you have a strong concern. Local antibiotic delivery is a very effective way to treat bone infections or what we call osteomyelitis. Alternatively, you could go straight to the second step and do a single stage repair of the non-union, in which case you want to think about your mechanical factors and your biologic factors. And in this case, I'm thinking about, well, it's a relatively small nail. Um, so I could go up on the nail and provide greater stability. I want to provide stability because we talked about the types of non-union, and this one looks like hyper to a oligotrophic. There's a big elephant's foot that's trying to form. There may be an alignment issue, too. It doesn't look like the upper part of the bone is totally aligned with the lower part of the bone. Um, and when I'm thinking about this plane, this AP is a coronal plane, I also want to know what the axial plane is. I'll examine the patient and see if there's a side-to-side -side rotational difference and how much their hip internally or externally rotates and understand if there's something to correct there. Perfect. Yeah, so you're leaning towards uh, exchange single nailing, ex single stage exchange nailing. And um, so, Bill, you did a, something a little bit different and you did exchange the nail, but you added a plate also just to seek more stability probably is my guess. And did you add any biology in any other way or? Um, no. And, uh, it was hyper. Yeah, hypertrophic, he's attempting to heal. I kind of think about it, you know, as his body is laying down callus, every time that nail moves a little bit or his femur moves around the nail, it's breaking up what vascular connections are attempting to be formed across uh, his fractured femur. So. Because it was more in that diametaphyseal area, this is uh, a little um, less uh, great for me for just an exchange nail for ismic fit. And also this guy is absolutely enormous. He's like the mountain guy from Game of Thrones. Like he's he works out all the time. He sleeps like 20 minutes a night. He's a complete... Uh, uh nut uh nut guy so i i, I uh, thought adding a plate was going to be helpful for stability to get him to unite so uh dr aker uh joe mentioned the nails was a little bit small that they put in so coming back to your discussion patient comes in because this comes up and he says you know the the last doctor you know they uh, they did this and it, i you know this is supposed to work 95% of the time did they do anything wrong or different that you would would have done. How would you answer? Them? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that my answer would really vary. I agree with what Dr. Patterson said. I think this all looks. You know, th these are the current images seven months after the skydiving accident. Uh, the reality is, over time, many reductions start to shift a little bit, and with a little bit of micro motion over thousands of gait cycles, the nail starts to wallow around inside the medullary canal. So I suspect that once upon a time, the alignment was a bit better and the nail was appropriate sized. I wasn't there. I don't have all the imaging, even if I did. Um, I just think that sometimes it's just a stroke of bad luck. I don't, I don't see anything profound that I would have done differently. I would ask you though, as the surgeon, I was sure that because of the subtle varus bowing for the med students, varus is sort of that knock need appearance. The subtle varus bowing of the femur, I was quite certain I was going to see a blocking screw 
I don't want to get beyond the scope of this talk, but it looks like you were able to improve the alignment without a blocking screw. So how did you get the femur so nice and straight, Dr. Mitchell? I think this was uh, one of those with the uh, ball spike lateral, me pushing as hard as I can while we're eccentrically reaming in some valgus. Nail goes up, it holds good alignment, um, and then uh, we lock it in. So that is uh, absolutely a great point. That, that this this would have been great, uh, you know, very very nice uh, way to do it as well. Just put a blocker, let the reamer. Uh, veer lateral as you you go and put the put the nail up. So, um, it, one of the comments in the chat um, ask about removing the distal screws as a first stage to try to load the fracture site and keep the intermediary nail. So, the only caution I'll put against that is that this is from is occurring because of too much motion. And if you take out the distal screws or dynamize the nail, you are increasing the amount of motion across that and it it is unlikely to help and if it does it's just going to take a lot longer so i i would probably dynamize one nail every two years um i'd say and it has to be the perfect patient at the perfect time um but tim, uh tim are there cases that you dynamize yeah i mean that that's a advanced question for a medical student so congratulations but Dynamization of diaphyseal fractures is absolutely a treatment for delayed unions and non-unions for appropriate selected fractures. In my mind, the ideal patient for a dynamization is one that has a delayed union or a non-union, clearly has not healed. Uh, <clears throat> Their leg still hurts, but they're not miserable. They just got back to work. If they don't keep, if they don't keep working, they're going to lose their job. They're going to lose their house because they can't pay their mortgage. Uh, they are they are not interested in a big operation. But uh, uh, is there something that can perhaps make get this to heal, get them to feel better? So uh, a lot of the nails. The locking options offer the ability to pull one or two screws out, leaving a screw in sort of the dynamic slot of the nail, which again is getting beyond the scope of what we need to discuss here. But there are select patients where I think dynamization is actually a pretty good option. Ad admitting that the success rate might only be 25 to 50% in those patients but they're not really ready or willing to undergo a big operation. So do you ever dynamize any fractures, any of the other panelists? Very rarely. Uh, one tibia, one tibia in that perfect patient that reached six months. The other point I'll make, Taylor, about this um so we exchanged the nail and added a plate that obviously added stability by upsizing the nail. You ream up the canal, it increases periosteal blood supply to it as another effect. Other options for this, which would be with completely within a, a scope of good practice, you could plate around the uh, nail and leave the nail, add stability with a plate. You could just exchange nail or you can do both. So you've got multiple options, but whatever you do, you need to increase the stability. Um, to get this to unite so sorry i was uh i don't know if it was my connection but i was uh not getting all of that so if i pause there for a sec uh but yeah everything looks to have healed here quite well you can see the difference between that gapped uh, elephant's foot looking fracture and this one where you can see bridging across those fracture lines and no more space this one's a bit different. Uh, this is a 60 year old female. She was actually sent from clinic to the ER and she had no trauma. And so that's already a bit of a worrisome finding. She has this fracture in sort of the proximal femur region, uh, sort of a transverse intertrochanteric fracture, not one you would typically see. And so already should be sounding off some alarm bells. When you see this patient in the ER, what's going through your mind, Joe? Well, that's a very unusual presentation. Um, what I'm looking at on the radiographs and CT shows me there's some approximal intertrochanteric fracture. There's varus alignment. There's 
a lot of sclerotic bone on the CT, which suggests this has been happening for a long time. It might even be a very gradual tension failure where the bone is breaking at a rate faster than it can heal. And that makes me wonder if there's something metabolic going on. A lot of older patients with low bone density are put on anti-resorptive medications like bisphosphonates, and those can result in fractures like this. We typically see them a little farther down the leg, but I'm wondering about that here. I don't see a big bone replacing lesion, which would make me think about something like neoplasia or you know, cancer, metastatic disease. This looks like a tension-related problem with a poorly healing bone in a large person that the weight is only making it worse. So those are excellent points about the assessment of this patient. Uh, but we're, you know, it's a surgical injury. And so how, what would be your guys' surgical tactic with something like this? Uh, I, I, I would put a guess on what some people might be thinking, uh, but uh, Anybody do, doing what we would call a blade plate for something like this, or is the nature of the history too concerning that you'd be worried about using a blade plate in this setting? I've seen Dr. Aker show an amazing series of blade plates. He's very skilled at it. Yeah, as much as I love a blade plate, um, this is a problem fracture that's going to take a very long time to heal. Um, so we know that nails being more in line with the mechanical axis generally tend to be able to hang on longer before failure. The students should know that any fracture we treat with implants, it's always a race between the fracture healing and the implants failing. Sooner or later, all the cycles of gates, uh, weight bearing, walking, 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 the implants are, are sharing that load until the fracture is completely healed. And uh, if it takes forever for that fracture to heal, well, the implants might start to fail, the screws might start to break, et cetera. So plating something like this is, while it's elegant and beautiful, it's probably a little bit less reliable than using a nail, which can hang on for months, if not years, before fatigue failure. So my answer here would be a cephalomedullary nail. Yeah, so that's what I did. And so my hope was when you disrupt that sclerotic bone that this would help healing. Perhaps I could have gotten a, a bit more medial start site or trochoformis, maybe even more to induce a bit better uh, valgus there if we're being critical and please feel free to throw stones but you're right we lost the race it did take a long time to heal this uh, is what happened at four months and we were sort of ongoing in that workup uh, of the endocrine processes that were potentially at play there's some low vitamin d alkaline phosphatase a little bit elevated some mildly elevated thyroid tests elevated ESR, but CRP is normal. So we're not super concerned about infection, but something's sort of off, something's maybe going on, uh, but we do proceed with revision. And at that time, we, we make sure to get inpatient endocrinology involved rather than working on things in the outpatient setting. Um, so we take out the broken hardware, we clamp to really induce that valgus. And you can see there how that start site could probably be better. It's a little bit lateral and probably could induce more valgus if uh, was able to get more medial along the uh, almost into the neck would be more ideal. Uh, but we're still able to get the nail in. And then we use an articulating tension device with a plate to induce more valgus while adding stability. And uh, then we lock it in with a bunch of screws in that plate to sort of support and add stability to that nail where we've hopefully induced a bit more valgus despite uh, uh, a less than ideal starting point. Um, and then we actually supplemented the biology here too because we didn't see much healing. And so this one, I was more worried that this is potentially an atrophic problem, even though it was potentially a stability problem too. Anyone do anything differently here? I really like that you added a tension band for this varus fracture that is failing in tension. You know, Taylor, one other thing that I'll just add uh, 
for the students who are about to be residents. Two words that are so powerful in situations like this that patients sometimes don't expect to hear. I'm sorry. You know, just when she comes in with worsening pain, you take an x-ray and now you got to go in and tell her that the nail is broken and she's going to need another surgery. I mean, saying I'm sorry is just so powerful. You know, it lets, lets them know that you're human. You're on their side. You never intended for this to happen. Um, and sometimes that uh, it's, it's amazing how disarming rather than being angry at you, what did you do wrong? I'm getting a second opinion. They're kind of like, uh, it's like, Oh, wow. This, this physician really cares about me enough to say, I'm sorry. It's not like you're taking the blame. We're just sorry that this happened to this poor old lady. You know, I'm sorry too. Powerful yeah, words. For sure. Uh, it does turn out that the endocrine workup, we found out she was on some medications um, that uh, that she got over the border that were likely contributing to uh, a lack of healing. And so as soon as we stop those, we feel like that made a, that made a difference. And we'll show you those post-op films where she healed. But I do want to touch on one thing briefly. I did supplement in this case, I used what we call a reamer irrigator aspirator to obtain bone graft uh, from within the canal, uh, intramedullary graft. And it's a special reamer that is able to suction some of that graft as you ream for a bigger nail. Um, other options are things like iliac crest bone graft. That may be something you've heard of in the past. Any other sources that you guys use frequently when you're looking to supplement biology and fractures? I like the uh, medullary harvesting, but today I did a non-union and um, she had bilateral femurs already nailed. And I don't generally use the tibia that much. Do you all use the tibial medullary canal? It's unusual, but in that setting uh, is typically when. Yeah. Yeah. So I used iliac crest today and I'll say we had a very fruitful harvest, Taylor. I really uh, have found uh, Dr. Dick's description of the gluteal pillar harvesting from the ilium with an acetabular reamer to be extremely efficient and effective in my larger non-union cases. Uh, and for smaller ones, I'll, I'll do a percutaneous harvest from the proximal tibia through Gertie's tubercle. I, I've done that as well. I haven't done the gluteal pillar, but uh, proximal tibia. But yeah, there's plenty of sources and sometimes you have to be creative, like Dr. Aker said, when there's already nails in place and, and look elsewhere, but there are plenty of sources that we can use. So in this case, uh, you can see there are post-op films, our intra-op fluoro showing a lateral there. And here she is at her last follow-up. Uh, she's about 11 months out and she's doing really well. So uh, I think we see some callus forming there and hopefully that, that heals for this go around, especially now that we got uh, some of those endocrine issues uh, in terms of the medicines res uh, resolved as well. So case three is sort of two cases and it's really nice because it's a, a tale of two femurs here. We're gonna compare side to side Joe, you, you submitted these cases, and so I'd love for you to take us through them and, and show us how they're same, same, but different. I'd love to. So there are two very similar patients. They're men in their 50s who are active laborers, and they're quite muscular and quite large gentlemen, but they're, they're relatively fit, and their jobs are physical. And they came in with very similar injuries. One was a motor vehicle collision on your left side of the screen. The other was fall downstairs in front of his house. And so they've got these pertrochanteric fractures with subtrochanteric extension. I suppose the left is really more just subtrochanteric, uh, but the pattern's very similar. It's a long spiral. Um, and the patients medically are very similar to each other. They got a lot of hypertension, not much else going on. So they were treated in two different ways. And we can talk about you know, the benefits and risks to each one of those and the complications associated with each. So and this is the, the femur, femur number one. And this is what it looks like in traction. It's 20 pounds of weight have been hung off a pin, put through the patient's tibia. 
and you can see in the upper part of the image, it's not really lined up completely with that. And that's, they're a muscular person. It's really hard to overcome that, at least while they're awake. We'll go to the other one. Same thing, 20 pounds of traction on him. And he also doesn't line up. He's still short by two centimeters or so. Um, so the patient on number one was treated with a closed reduction internal fixation. You may have covered this in previous discussions, but the idea is if we don't expose the fracture surgically, but manipulate it through indirect means, then maybe we're preserving the biology. Uh, some of the ways of doing this include using special tables that have attachments for patients' body parts, pushing with a mallet or devices on the table or a post between the legs to help get the right vectors and alignment of the bones and then fix them through small incisions using a nail like uh, Taylor described earlier. And the patient on number two was treated in a different way. And so for simple fractures, especially in this area, can be expeditious to treat them with an open approach. And first, this guy is very large. That's a long incision. Um, and a large surgical exposure with significant blood loss. And there's risks associated with that, like infection, wound problems. But getting the fracture aligned and the pieces of bone touching each other, it's easier to get a anatomic direct reduction. And that can be associated with a better uh, probability of healing. So we can use clamps once we've exposed the fracture. The closed reduction uh, looks like this. This is not my case. That doesn't really matter because I've malreduced femurs before too. And you can see here's the start site. You know, and it, we don't have a good understanding of where the shaft is in relation to the proximal femur. We don't know if the alignment's right. It looks good on the lateral, but maybe it could be a slightly better lateral. And we like that pin to be a center in the head to get things lined up right. Anyway, we make that pin and then ream over to put a nail in. The other femur, Femur number two, the left one, was the one that was opened, and two clamps were used to put the bones back almost exactly how they started before they broke. And a pin is placed that's in line with the canal and properly positioned to put screws in the upper part of the femur into the neck and head. How, how do you make a big incision and reduce that in that way and still, as we talked about our AO principles at the beginning, respect biology? With some of the surgical approaches we use, uh, exploit planes around muscles. So I'm not going in there and scraping things apart. I'm making an incision through skin. That'll heal side to side. I make an incision through fascia. And then I find the muscle and I carefully dissect that muscle off the femur while trying to preserve uh, blood vessels, in this case from the profunda femoris system, to it as much as I can. And then while being careful not to manipulate the tissues too much, get clamps around without stripping the entire bone wherever possible. And when we say stripping, we're talking about the lining of the bone is the periosteum, that is bone forming cells and preserving that where you can, sometimes it's disrupted by the fracture, can help with healing. Yeah, I always found that tricky as a student when people just talked about stripping and stuff like that. So it's really helpful for you to explain that to the students. So Medi here's the post-ops. Right, immediately after surgery, femur number two looks exactly like a femur. Femur number one looks really close. Um, the implants are reasonably sized, positioned well, in the right length. But you can see that outline shows where the femur should be. However, it's probably not quite lined up right. There's a little bit of varus there. And that's may relate to how the starting guide wire was placed. So the alignment you get is only as good as, <laughs> as your technique. And so sometimes there's things we consider serious medical errors. And there are things that are technical errors, which aren't perfect. And they're not a, wouldn't fault somebody in court for doing it, right? But you, there's an opportunity to improve the technique that may deliver a better reduction. Maybe a better reduction has a better outcome long-term. So where the guide wire goes matters to the type of implant you're doing. Some are straight. Straight nails should be straight down the canal. Um, the other type of nail you showed earlier is a trochanteric nail, and that has a slightly offset start site. The other thing to think about is it looks like the head of the femur is pointing back towards the pelvis, and it makes me wonder if there's maybe a rotational issue. 
even if the alignment's right on your AP or your lateral, uh, you could be off in the axial plane. And that means pieces of bone aren't touching each other that otherwise should be. So important thing to do at the end of one of these cases is to check and make sure the legs match each other. See the rotation, see the length, compare them after you've done the surgery as shown here. So over time, you can see that started in the right femur, the femur number one started in a varus malalignment and it progressed to more varus malalignment and the screws started to back out and down at the bottom, the screw broke. So we have what looks like a non-union developing here and it may be related to a technical error. That's not to say that every subtrochanteric femur fracture should be opened. That's a whole nother bag of worms, but a close reduction needs to be as close as possible to an anatomic reduction. And I think we talked about the paperclip analogy before. The race, the race. The race. Uh, a CT scan shows that you know, despite this nail auto-dynamizing and the patient self-dynamizing by breaking the implant and compressing at the fracture, it's still not healing. There's a clear fracture line. Uh, in these situations, I also noticed that his leg was kind of rotated when I met him. Um, and so I got a CT scan and compared both femurs to see if there was a difference in the rotation side to side. There's some techniques we can use to see how the head of the femur is related, you know, upper part to the lower part. Or the condyles of the femur, if they're flat on the floor, which way is the head pointing? Should be about 12, 13 degrees anterior. There's a lot of variation in different people. So having a comparison of both femurs can be helpful. Turns out this guy had a rotational problem to connect correct too. It means that the fracture parts are separated. So when I'm thinking about taking care of a non-union, I like to come up with a list of all the problems I need to address. You know, I'm not going to get a big change on his body habitus anytime soon, but we have a non-union that's causing pain. It looks like there's a rotation or what we call torsion of the femur. Um, that's something I can address. His leg's a bit short, so that's interfering with how he walks. And I can try to get as much of that back, but I'll have to balance lengthening his femur with maybe having a, a hole or a gap that needs to heal, maybe a less reliable solution. So in this particular case, you know, old implant, they're not concerned about an infection based on the labs. The old implants came out. Uh, we then used a blade plate for this case. And so I thought that was a nice solution because I could get absolute stability and compress across the non-union side and showing signs of trying to heal. So I can use the plate and then insert screws called lag screws. And they're gliding through one side and pulling on the other and pulling the pieces together. Uh, the oblique, well, there's some advanced things about the obliquity and whether any compressing with another device like Taylor used is appropriate for this, but ultimately this is his outcome. And he is short by about five, five or six millimeters, which he deals just fine with a, a shoe uh, insert in a shoe. Um, he's gone on to heal. We corrected quite a bit of his rotational deformity too, and he's come back to work and he's happy. That's an excellent result for sure. I did use bone graft for this too, and I took it from his pelvis with the lemurs. So from those three cases, just a few take-home points that we want you to remember about the different types of non-unions. And then always rule out infection, identify what other causes may be contributing to the problem, and then correct them. Typically that involves addressing mechanics, addressing host factors, and sometimes adding biology. So our next case is a 30-year-old uh, or a female in her 30s. She was involved in an autoverse pedestrian accident while on a bicycle. She has some social factors that may impact her outcome, but she's got this complex fracture here of the hip socket. We didn't talk a lot about these, but they are complex injuries and require complex treatment. So here's a little bit uh, more advanced imaging, and you can see all these fracture lines that extend into that articular surface. And when we talked before about fractures near joints, we talked about things like direct reduction and primary stability uh, to get the bones to heal in an appropriate position without callus. And so when that happens, how are you, how are you trying to do that, like in this case, Joe? You know, the uh, acetabulum is a complicated uh, surgical topic. We are trying to get the joint right as close as we can. It's hard to see 
so some of the reductions we get are direct in that we see these pieces of bones, we see a puzzle we can solve, and it's a lot of pushing down on one part, pushing down on another part to put them back together. For a lot of the time, that brings the pieces that have joint surface on them, the cartilage back and makes a nice congruent you know, cavity cup that the femoral head can sit into. And to do that, sometimes we can do it percutaneously, but the most reliable way to do that is to make a big open exposure like we talked about. And in this case, you working through multiple windows around major nerves and blood vessels, we can access that fracture site and push on the bones, push it down, push it over, and restore the, the joint stability, and then hold it in place with some implants that we're doing what our hands, our instruments, or our clamps were doing. That's the big picture. And so in yeah. the fluoroscopy here is showing some sequences in this fracture where we were working through a couple windows. And I think all, all three windows have been ileoamental. And then I put in an intrapelvic plate, which achieves some of those buttress modes of fixation for the fracture. That took some time. Yeah, and arguably, yeah, it would be an excellent result for sure. I mean, it looks great. And your CT shows that too. You got the joint pretty much anatomic, I would say. Would you have done anything differently, Phil? Such a deep dive uh, to go in, into um, a complicated topic. No, I, I would reduce uh, as Joe has and fix uh, with enough metal that would take it to union. So probably a similar approach, you know, and uh, when we talk about risk and consenting patients, uh, this is the, a little bit longer discussion because it's a bigger approach and there are more risks to it. And so you spend more time on the front end, the lay down uh, crate, if you will, that this is a complicated uh, problem, but going to be here with you through it all to take you to uh, you getting back and walking. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into uh, if this patient did have a complication, but you got you to be prepared to handle those because once you operate on them, you buy you buy the patient, you know, um, and that means uh, taking care of complications uh, as well. Get, this For is a sure. complex patient, too, you know, uh, socially. So you got to take that into account. Yeah, well, and I give it's the complications talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. well, I give you credit because you, you, it sounds like your care team did a lot for this patient in terms of uh, their social determinants of health, which are very important factors in, with regard to this patient's outcome. Uh, but sometimes the deck is just stacked uh, against the patient some of the time, and and it looks like uh, the patient came back with uh, wound dehiscence. Uh, unable to walk, and then draining fluid. And those inflammatory markers that we talked about are pretty elevated. Yeah. Uh, so in this, in, in my mind, this is an infection. Uh, anybody disagree, I guess? No, I, I wonder, uh, Tim, so I, like infection and in trauma comes at like stages, right? This is six months out, she's uh, presumably healed. And then there's a like two week post-op, you just nailed an open tibia, for a, like, what should a medical student know about managing an infection and trauma? Like, when can you take the metal out? Do you always have to take the metal out? How do you decide that? Yeah, that's a great question, but I don't really think it's a med student level question. I mean, these are complicated answers that even at the level of us, we we could argue, we could discuss all night. I think the basics of in fracture related infection. Uh, if there's pus, you cannot just treat it with antibiotics. You, you need the solution to pollution is a knife. So you need to go in and cut out non-viable infected necrotic tissue and do a debridement, then an irrigation. Uh, consider the pros and cons of removing the implants because uh, the only thing that bacteria love more than dead tissue is instability. So remember, if you're if you're taking all the metal out because you're worried about a biofilm that's developing on the implant, well, now you have to think about the instability that might be present that might potentiate the soft tissue injury and make the infection worse. So debridement, um, re removal of the infection, the uh, the abscess, it's typically surgical. Uh, consider retaining versus 
removing the implants, culture specific antibiotics. And uh, typically, are y'all still doing six weeks of IV antibiotics, Phil? I don't know there's some lore about that and some new thoughts on that. What are you doing at Vandy? I think the more common folks are going home on PO. I think the majority are still going on IV. I think our ID team has bought uh, into some of the PO um, for for some of these. So uh, thankfully, it's not a tremendous number of patients. But if you're at a high energy center and you see a lot of open tibias, that's uh, you know a 20, 30, 10, 20, 30 percent infection rate, depending on how bad open it is. And so um, it it'll if you have it's seen you if you haven't seen it if you're operating it up and um at a, at a high volume high energy center i'd say yeah and you can see here this patient got a ct scan you see this fluid collection with sort of some walls suggestive of an abscess there and so is it an infection i think we all agree on that and there are a few definitions by which we come to that uh, but most recently we have worked within the ao to some degree there's a committee that worked on defining fracture-related infections, sort of like the joints uh, surgeons did with respect to periprosthetic infections. And so uh, this is a really great article that runs through this patient uh, or applies to this patient in terms of some of the criteria. She, it sounds like she met a few of them, which, uh, both uh, suggestive and confirmatory with the draining wound, essentially. And so what was your tactic in this case, Joe? Yeah, you know, I was I was fortunate that our ED had a, already obtained a CT scan that showed our fracture is healed, as you, you would hope it would be, at six months. Uh, we removing things that can be contaminated, like the metal, to reduce the biofilm burden is important. That's not a low risk surgery at all. Taking out intrapelvic hardware like this is is dangerous. We went in near obturator nerve and vein and femoral vein the first time and elbow and bladder and all that stuff is now literally scarred to this plate or adjacent to it. Um, so my surgical strategy is to take everything out and reduce the, the burden. My tactics are to, you know, do a very, very careful meticulous dissection. I let my vascular colleague know what I'm, um, what I'm doing over in 22. And I let my, my urology colleague know, hey, once in a while I get into a bladder problem with this. If, I, if something happens, I'm gonna give you a call. We got lucky that did not happen. Um, I suppose we were careful, but lucky too. We get uh, many cultures. Um, and for these cases, I'll hold on antibiotics to try to improve the yield of operative cultures till we've obtained them, then give our, our perioperative, peri-incisional antibiotics to prove, reduce the risk of surgical site infection. Yeah, and it looks like uh, this patient was fortunate to get oral antibiotics, a little bit more convenient. Um, Social concern, too, because if her, she'd relapse on her IV drug use and going home with a peripheral inserted catheter is a convenient place to put heroin. We're going to sort of skip this one just in the interest of time because uh, it gets into sort of uh, additional territory because we still... I uh, want to thank you all for tuning in because it's been a long road and you put a lot of effort in and you stuck with us through it all. Don't forget to get your last and final badge. Uh, and then the sessions will still be recorded as before. And then what I will say, we just want to really emphasize our gratitude for you guys tuning in, being so uh, great about questions and engagement all along the way uh, and really keeping things dynamic for us and keeping us on our toes. Uh, and we hope that it gives you a good introduction to what the AO uh, is about and uh, gives you some stimulus to continue to uh, work with and learn from our community as you proceed in your training. Anything you guys want to add? No, I want to personally thank Dr. Mitchells and Yong for all the effort you guys put in this whole year. Dr. Patterson, very much. I don't know if all the students know how hard Phil and Taylor work every single month to help put on these performances, these webinars, these learning endeavors. And uh, I've been fortunate to log on to nearly everyone. And the, if they'll continue to have me, I really enjoy this atmosphere. I got to say this organization has truly helped make me who I am today.
So I encourage you all to continue to stay active and stay involved and register for next year's round coming back around. And uh, I look forward to many more years and to meeting many of you in person. Phil, thoughts? It's been great. It's been fun. It's been great fun. So we we have enjoyed doing it. We hope it lights a fire for trauma for y'all. We really, um, you know, one of the best parts for me is just being able to see Tim's face uh, once a month and be able to just uh, learn from each other uh, and see each other. And uh, again, if you if you like this, uh, ortho trauma may be for you. You know, so just keep it on your your radar and uh it, it's a phenomenal uh career we really we really enjoy it so and then yeah just one final plug next sessions will start on july 11th for a whole new cycle and like dr aker said we're going to include a lot more uh material a lot more subject areas and so it's not going to be redundant so if you're an mms1 a two a three a four even keep tuning in because it'll be new info uh and some new uh guest faculty uh, and really ramping things up across the board. So thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for joining us, Joe. Thanks for your time and your insight. And uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you to the AO staff and the panelists. Beautifully produced. <laughs>